this week we're looking at a motoring genre which has shaken off the shackles of a poor image. For in days of old, estates all seemed to be Volvos driven by antique dealers. All driving pleasure was designed out, and you had turned the corner from vibrant youth onto the slippery slope towards a pension. Audi were the first major manufacturer to challenge this with their RS2 models in conjunction with Porsche. Now there's a sporting avant in every Audi A4 or A6 range. Of course, the estate car is nothing new. From the dawn of motoring, people have added load space to their saloons or sedans to create estates, station wagons or avants. Post-war, though, the Swedes have been taking it awfully seriously. Today we look at our motoring panel's top 10 estates. In at number 10 is the Rep's favourite workhorse, Vauxhall's Vectra, designed with long motorway journeys in mind, which is just as well, because it gives a driving experience as thrilling as daytime television. But as long as you're doing those plodding motorway jaunts with your wares, the Vectra does the job well enough. The latter versions are better for the driver, but all carry enough space out back to be competitive. There's no denying it, Vauxhall are very clever in that they managed to engineer something comfortingly familiar about all their cars. Get into any Vauxhall and you'll feel instantly at home. And the new Vectra is a great example. Dave. What? Dave? What? Oh, sorry. Well, it's hardly the most exciting choice. How about our number nine, then? If the Vauxhall seems a little dull, the new Renault Laguna offers a little Gaelic flair. You can say it's pig ugly while styling is a subjective subject. And subjectively speaking, it's quite ugly. While some will find it an attractive alternative, a bold attempt to break free from the blandness which permeates this class of car. It's the new Renault Laguna 2, taking over from one of Renault's most successful cars ever. Now, I want you to watch this very carefully, because we're going to use the special Ritchie slow-mo cam in order that you can spot one special detail or more particularly one detail that's missing. Note, the car was locked. I didn't use a key. I used this nifty little key card. No fuss, no bother. Press the button and go. The new Laguna aims to knock the class-leading Passat and Mondeo models off their pedestals with keen pricing and groundbreaking technology. Here, Renault have really pushed the boat out. Keyless ignition is just one of the gizmos, while the company also promised a comforting ride as well. Unfortunately for a model set at taking on the Mondeo and Passat, the build quality does let the Laguna down. It lacks rigidity compared with German offerings, and it's ugly. No, it's not. Is so. Is not. Number 8 is another charmer from France. Following the successful 405, pressure was on Peugeot and they launched the 406. The result is a car regarded by many to set the class standard in terms of ride and handling. 
Unlike many designer estates, the 406 has a boxy rear end, so you can still manage those large, boxy loads. It still manages to look attractive, though. Inside, things are a little bland. Peugeot have always invested more on their body shapes and chassis than the place you spend most of your time in, and it shows. Everything you could want is here. Even satellite navigation will be standard on some models in 2001, but it's just not a very exciting place to sit. This new engine has definitely improved the low down torque. It's a car that's got a reasonable degree of performance. Diesels are seriously important business for Peugeot. They've made a staggering 8 million in the last 20 years. With a 406, they've sold 600,000 so far, 53% of which have been diesels. So this engine is very important to the Peugeot range. Overall, it beats the Vectra on everything but sales. And it beats the Renault on build quality. But it is still a little long in the tooth and possibly too bland to climb any higher in our chart. Sliding into number seven with all the efficiency you'd expect from the fatherland is Volkswagen's Passat. If you want a car the size of our previous three, but with the build quality and feeling of solidity from a class up, you could do worse than start here. From a distance, you might mistake the Passat for an Audi, which is a remarkable coincidence, as the VW is based on a stretched Audi platform. The inbreeding goes as far as sharing engines and on some models the four-wheel drive system. Engines. Well, you've got a choice of eight in total, of which three are new. There are four diesel and three petrol. The new ones are two 1.9-litre TDI diesel engines, one with 101 and one with 130 brake horsepower, and a 170 brake horsepower V5 petrol engine. Mm, lovely. Early adverts featured obsessive engineers who were fanatical about perfection, and the interior reflects this. High quality plastics and materials abound. Loads of mid range, all the punch you'd expect from a good modern diesel. That allied to plenty of power and not bad economy either. Even the grab handles over the doors are dampened rather than snapping back. A marvel of German engineering. Yes, it is. A triumph of design detail over not-so-clever stuff. Uh, yes? Let's face it, it is a little boring. Oh, come on, it's everything you could want. Well-built, reliable and roomy. Exactly. It's so good that it's positively boring. Where are the characterful faults which make it seem a little more human? The quirks, the sense of fun. I worry about you sometimes, Dave. In the best tradition of there ain't no substitute for cubic inches, we move up a size with our number six, the Vauxhall Amiga. This car is one of the best kept secrets in motoring. Were it to wear a more prestigious badge, it would sell like hot cakes. The interior space is impressive. The enormous boot out back is square and it has no lip to snag loads on. Even the three litre V6 returns close to 30 miles to the gallon, as well as a delicious burble. Now, although Vauxhall make great play of competing with the main German manufacturers like Mercedes, BMW and Audi, in reality, the user-chooser company car driver who has perhaps 25 to 30,000 pounds to spend on their next car, well, 
I'm afraid they're going to choose an E-Class or an A6 or a 5 Series over the Amiga, no matter how good this car is. The company car driver who doesn't have a choice, well, this is no bad car to have in their driveway. But perhaps the main rivals for the new Amiga are the Saab 95, the Volvo S80 or the new Rover 75. The smaller engines fare a little less well with the car's bulk. Don't bother at all if you live in the mountains. A little known bonus though is the 2.5 litre turbo diesel is in fact the excellent BMW 6 cylinder unit. Very posh. The ride and handling are also reminiscent of the cars from BMW. Not quite as polished, but many thousands cheaper. You really do get a lot of car for your money. There is only one problem. The Vauxhall badge. Leading to mammoth depreciation. Badge snobbery? You wouldn't catch me falling for that one. In at number five, and now we're talking the Volvo V70. How can you seriously consider an estate without looking at a Volvo? Bad snobbery, you wouldn't catch me falling for that one. I shall rise above that comment. There is no surprise that a Volvo is in our top ten estates, but it says a lot for the cars above it if the V70 gets a lowly fifth slot. Over the last decade, Volvo have exploded the myth that all their cars are as boxy as very boxy boxes that handle like a box riding on a blancmange. If anything, you'd probably not be wise to use your V70 to take that cross-country run to your dentist for a set of fillings. The ride is firm, verging on the sporty. Yes, I did say sporty. The biggest surprise, though, is the fun you can have driving this heavy load lugger. The firm ride pays dividends when you wish to move more quickly down your favourite road. Motorway runs are refined, making this a viable alternative to more prestigious marks. That said, you do pay at the petrol pumps for the weight of this safety-conscious wagon. Surprisingly, pipping the V70 into our number four slot is the Saab 95. Last year, we road tested the Saab 95 and the Volvo V70 back to back, expecting the V70 to romp home. But no. Firstly, the 95's softer ride makes the Saab a more relaxing place to spend time. While we're sitting inside, the interior has better quality plastics and is a more attractive design. Outside, the shape, while less bold than the Volvo, is more sophisticated. Not bad for a car on a stretched Vauxhall Vectra platform. Get away! The best way to enjoy your 9.5 estate is to sit back, calm and unruffled. Think club class again on a long intercontinental flight. Just reserve that acceleration for takeoff and maybe a bit of overtaking. But be warned, when you do come to land, you might find the brakes are a bit of a surprise. It's not that they're not there, they are. But you will have to give the pedal a bit of a prod. Since General Motors took an interest in Saab, the Swedish company has been using floor pans from Opals as the basis of their current designs. Well, I'll be a... Uh, yes, I've heard that. Funny. The 9.5 comes with a choice of three engines, all, of course, turbocharged. You get the base two-litre model, this 2.3, and a 3-litre V6. This 2.3 produces 170 brake horsepower. Acceleration is pretty good, around about 9 seconds, 0 to 60 top speed of 140 miles an hour. Now, it does use a drive-by-wire throttle. A linked with this 4-speed automatic box makes acceleration very swift and rapid. So that's our top 10 from 10 to 4. Join us after the break for our top three estates. Welcome back to our top 10 estate cars. Having moved from 10 to 4, we now enter the realm of the heavy hitters. And they don't come much heavier than our number three, the Mercedes E-Class. The perception of weight is emphasised by the hewn from granite quality, as well as the imposing rear overhang which liberates extra load space. Of course, Mercedes have a similar history to Volvo as far as estates and safety are concerned, so you can rest assured that this car scores highly on both counts. 
However, like our Swedish friends, even the sportiest E-Class fails to get the pulse racing as a driving experience. But Dave, you don't buy an E-Class if you wish to emulate Sterling Moss. For most owners, the allure of this car is the three-pointed badge and the prestige it brings. It attracts badge snobbery of amazing proportions. Yet of our 10, the Merc holds its value from new the best. Overall, the E-Class is here because it is a Mercedes and it carries all the benefits we've come to expect from the Stuttgart firm. There's nothing to get excited about, but everything asked of the E is dispatched with Teutonic efficiency. As the cream rises to the top of our chart, we enter the top two. Our panel had a hard time choosing between our top contenders, but pipped into our number two position is the BMW 5 Series Touring. Dynamically, the BMW 5 Series is the benchmark that other marks aspire to. Build quality is close to the Mercedes, but complete with delightful design touches. BMW have evolved their shape and maintained a solid identity. The double kidney grille and twin headlamps are staple ingredients in the BMW lineage. As is a well-balanced rear-wheel drive chassis. From the 518 through to the six-cylinder models, the mighty V8s, there isn't a bad engine in the range. All are smooth, and once past the four-cylinder models, the performance is electrifying. The ride and handling match the ride and quality of the engines. Any car which makes the driver want to drive just for the hell of it has to be good. The 5 Series is that good. No journey is a chore, and a well-appointed cabin adds to the pleasure. The high-quality plastics and switchgear combined with excellent ergonomics. Hold it. There's one glaring problem. What? The boot. It's smaller than a hamster's jockstrap. Oh, but it does have a nice slidey thing on the floor to help you remove heavy items. Yes, very nice. But this is the top ten of estates. And so far as boot space goes, the 5 Series, sexy as it is, can't hack it. The boot is tiny. Oh, fair enough. Before we discover which is our panel's best estate car that money can buy, here's a rundown from 10 to 2. At 10, the rep's favourite, and if you want to buy British, rush out to buy one while they're still made in Luton, the Vauxhall Vectra. At 9, an electronic tour de force in the new version, or quirky alternative to the Mondeo in the old, the Renault Laguna. At number 8, classy to drive but starting to show its age, the Peugeot 406. At number 7 is the extremely well-built Passat, which wants to be an Audi when it grows up. Underrated at 6, the Vauxhall Omega brings a BMW or Audi driving experience down to Vauxhall prices. A heavy hitter at 5, the surprisingly talented but thirsty Volvo V70. Shock of our 10, a surprising entry at number 4, the Saab 95, Sweden's best kept secret. Moving up a class at number 3, the Mercedes E Class, hewn from granite build quality but lacking soul as a driving experience. And at number 2, the best driver's car of our 10 but lacking that crucial boot space, the BMW 5 Series Touring. Matching the Mercedes for build quality. With optional Quattro four-wheel drive and bristling with technology. Ladies and gentlemen, our best estate is the Audi A6. The secret to the Audi's success is consistency. It isn't the best driver's car here, but it is near the top of the list. It doesn't quite beat the Mercedes on build quality, but you'd be picky to find fault with the Audi. Similarly, it takes on the pair as a practical load lugger with strong location points for heavy luggage in the large square boot. 
Yet here you'll find carpet which, although hard wearing, wouldn't disgrace a posh house. The Quattro Drive Train we mentioned earlier is just one of the special engineering features that will surprise and delight. Yet it isn't faultless. Although the chassis is extremely competent and you always feel relaxed, it doesn't feel alive as the BMW. Even the grippy Quattro versions seem to have limits that you can't explore, and you feel the car's driving you rather than the other way round. The A6 is a very impressive drive. That huge engine provides seemingly limitless thrust. Doing 0 to 60 in 7.1 seconds in a car of this size it feels a bit like sitting on top of a falling piano. And the braking is equally good. It'll soon have your eyeballs bouncing off the back of your sunglasses. And the grip, it never seems to run out. Those enormous tyres will, I suspect, continue gripping long past the point when the jig forces have rendered you unconscious. If you cover great distances, this is ideal because you climb out of the A6 feeling as fresh as when you got into it, as do your passengers. This is obviously what Audi had in mind, making it a very worthy number one. Join us next week for the top 10 soft roaders, 4x4s that don't claim to have fun in the rough stuff.